Donna Brazil drops a bomb in the middle of the Democrats' healing process. We've got a DNC member to give his thoughts on everything that happened last week. And House Republicans unveil their tax plan. We'll talk about how much it's going to cost you. And it's election night across America. We're watching the results out of Virginia, New Jersey, and more. We've already got some exciting results. It's Tuesday, November 7th. Welcome to The Political Beat. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Hey, everybody, welcome to After Buzz TV's The Political Beat, the millennial show and podcast, uh, giving you the latest and greatest in Washington politics and everything around the world. I'm your host, Drexel Hurd, the semi moderate voice of the left. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and pretty much everywhere at Drexel Hurd. And I am Chelsea Galicia, the lefter of the left voices on the show. You can follow me at Chelsea Galicia. Which is why she sits on the left-hand side of the table. And I should move towards the center, actually, just oh, so it please. makes more sense. Um, just an update on open, open enrollment is still open through December 15th. Signups are already breaking records right now, even though the Trump administration slashed 90% of the advertising budget um, because, you know, he is... He knows big things. He knows how to, he's, yeah, he's definitely a marketing genius on that <laughs> part. Uh, be sure to sign up and get covered and get folks you know covered. Um, also, I also don't know how many times we've said this uh, this year so far, uh, but we're definitely thinking about the families, the 40 plus families affected in Texas over the <laughs> weekend. Uh, lots of information coming out of Texas about this shooter in this church. Um, it's, it's pretty infuriating the way that Republicans um, have handled um, gun related things across the country and I always say and I tweeted it out yesterday I think that we're doing gun control all wrong oh, is that I right? think that we should be going after the NRA first and not the guns you go after the, the snake and then the rest will follow I mean I like the approach but how would you go after them I don't know we got to figure that out I'm, mm. I'm gonna that, that's gonna be for bigger and better people to do that Mm. Me on the other hand, I'll just tweet about. I'll guy. just tweet about it, and hopefully that some nobody pays attention to me. I don't have a blue check. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> on today's show, uh, we've got the latest on the DNC and Donna Brazil's bombshell with a DNC member, Michael Cap, and we're going to break down the election results from across the country. And we're going to talk about that tax plan here with our okay. good friend, uh, Mr. Scott Moore from the Trump Report. Uh, so last week, Donna Brazil, former interim. DNC chair, Clinton White House aide, Al Gore campaign manager, Democratic statue. Um, I like Donna Brazil a lot, but I don't know what happened last week. She released an excerpt of her upcoming book, Hacks Inside the, in, the Inside Story of Break-Ins and Breakdowns that Put Donald Trump in the White House. Um, her excerpt came out in Politico. The title of that article was Inside Hillary Clinton's Secret Takeover of the DNC with the subline, when I was asked to run the Democratic Party after the Russians hacked her emails, I stumbled into the shocking truth about the Clinton campaign. Shocking. Mm -hmm. So here to give us his reaction to last week's story is California's youngest elected member to the DNC and a fellow California delegate and my good friend Michael Cap. Michael Cap, welcome to the program. Happy Election Day. Happy, happy Election Day. We're going to be talking about, I mean, I can't. I'm Are you going to do your election night hum? I, I always do the MSNBC hum. The oh. bam, 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 but I can't do that just yet because we're not talking about election results. We've got some, got some important things to talk about, even though the election uh, results are very important tonight. So, uh, Michael, thanks for coming on. want to get your initial reaction to last week's story. I saw your Facebook post, but I kind of want to um, get you to elaborate more on what your thoughts were when you first heard about or first read Donna Brazil's story out of Politico? Well, I, I was uh, still shocked, despite that I, you, you kind of know once you're involved in the DNC how little power and influence you actually have. It was something that uh, uh, the incumbent DNC members warned me about when I first uh, started to run. But there's not a whole lot of communication at the DNC. At least there, was, there wasn't at the time. And uh, for something like this to, to happen without even informing the other DNC officers is uh, incredibly uh, shocking and depressing. But thankfully, we, we have a new DNC under the leadership of Chairman Tom Perez and Deputy Chair Ellison. And uh, transparency and accountability is definitely a focus of the DNC moving forward. 
Yeah, so I, I was listening to Tom, uh, Keith Ellison on a Pod Saves America uh, last week, and he had some really great things to say about what they're working on. Um, so the bombshell comes out. And I and, sent it. Drexel, and she have sends you it to me, right? And I was like, "Of course, I've seen this crazy story." I saw um, it months ago. So then, what? So you, that was your initial reaction. What was your reaction after everything started coming out? As we started to hear, like, "Well, this is how it really happened." Like, did that change well, my, your initial reaction? My my initial reaction was my my heart was broken because here we we had proof. Uh, that the, the primary process that's run by the DNC uh, was not entirely fair. It, I, I supported uh, Hillary Clinton twice, both in the primary and the general election, but I also supported Keith Ellison twice on, on two ballots for, for DNC chair. And uh, I, I want transparency, I want accountability, and most of all, the DNC needs to be held up to a very high standard. We need to have a fair primary process for our presidential candidates. This is the one responsibility, the, the main responsibility that the DNC has. And I don't think that we fulfilled that responsibility back in 2016. So I have a question about when you say fair, because there's a lot of terms that have been kind of thrown around, whether I was rigged, whether that I was fair. Do you think it was un unfair in the sense that after everything that we found out that the Clinton campaign had, I wouldn't even say veto power, but they did have some sort of influence, Absolutely. some sort of influence over staff picks Strategy, early on. Strategy, budget, everything. Well, I mean, it was their budget. But staff picks when it comes to the DNC um, as early, because it didn't seem to me that they staffed anybody. Other than, even the communications director wasn't a Clinton pick once they got down to it. So how can you explain, like, from your point of view, how you saw that as an unfair process? Do you think it was more unfair as a in the primary because it didn't really change any votes? Or did you think that it was just like the DNC just I'm trying to figure out where the unfairness came from. <laughs> where, doesn't see it as unfair. I, I'm still trying to understand that piece of it. Absolutely. So just some background. When we have a presidential nominee, the nominee takes over our national party. Um, but going into the, the last election, the DNC has suffered through eight years of uh, neglect. Uh, we, we weren't fundraising. The, the national party was essentially neutered. Uh, President Obama, I, I love him, but he did not care for the national party. A lot of the resources that would have gone to the DNC instead went to uh, Obama for America, which became Organizing for America, and they focused on one goal, and the goal was the first election and then re-election of the president. But meanwhile, the DNC has a, a broader mission, and, and that mission is to elect Democrats from, from the school board to the, the Congress. And with, uh, without the DNC being fully funded, fully staffed, and with it really being sidetracked, we saw a, uh, our, our down ballot races really be, be affected. But to, to get back to your original question, we, we need to have a, a fair process. And while it's, it would be perfectly acceptable, I think everyone would agree that whoever won our presidential primary, that they would have uh, not only influence, but outright control over what the DNC does in the general election. Everyone agrees that that's fine. But for this sort of conversation to be happening during the presidential uh, primary um, was, was, I believe, unfair. And we, we, we can't have that happen. So I have a question on uh, that piece of it. So we know the DNC right out the gate. Obviously, um, it's no secret my position on Bernie Sanders entering the Democratic process. Um, do you think that the DNC didn't fully embrace Bernie out the gate because he wasn't a Democrat? Like Or because well, well and, Hillary I, and, and I say no and I say that because and, and I say that because Barack Obama won in 08 and, and the Clintons pretty much owned the Democratic Party since since 
Bill Clinton was the last elected Democratic oh, president. Oh, there was another agreement in No, no, no. What I'm, say, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, is that the Clintons still had, Clinton still had people there. So it wasn't it, like Barack Obama still had an uphill battle to decline. Barack Obama had a different story. It's not a different story. Barack Obama had an uphill battle to decline. There was not an agreement the way there was an agreement but, here. Right, but. If where she literally owned it. She, she, she didn't own she, it. She, she, she funded the money. Um, which I mean, she, is, she kept which, the she kept the Democratic Party afloat, uh, and that's the, it's a nice the reality. Way to look at it. So, but my question is, is do you feel like the Democratic Party should be allowing people who are not members of the Democratic Party to run in the Democratic primary? There's there's no question in my mind, and I've been very clear on this for for years. Uh, Bernie Sanders is a better Democrat than most elected Democrats. While I would love for, for him to be registered as a Democrat and to run as a Democrat, we need to do a better job at the national party and, and our state parties and local parties to encourage Bernie Sanders and fellow independents to find the states to join our party. It, it's incumbent upon us who are activists within the party to try to bridge that gap and trying to uh, force Bernie Sanders to, to run as a Democrat um, or, or saying that he's not one uh, just because of his party registration, I, I think is is a step too far. Right, but but then don't you? I feel like independents are independents for a reason. They sometimes agree with Republicans. They sometimes agree with Democrats. That doesn't necessarily make them Democrats. I mean, there's people are independents for a reason because they don't they want to identify with a certain party because they may or may not vote for a Republican in another in another election. They may vote for the Democrats when at the has general Bernie election. When voted I'm for not saying that, well, I mean, for a Republican. I'm not saying that Bernie voted for a Republican. What I'm saying is that there are independents out there who may or may not be interested in identifying with a certain party. Um, so I think that's why I'm very adamant about Republicans voting for Republican candidates, Democrats voting were in the primary to decide their elected leader. You would leader. be singing a different tune if Bernie had split the vote. Uh, I, I would be sing. I mean, I, I don't think. I think that the process would be. Would, anyway, we'll get. We'll get to that. Um, so, for, for for the record, on on that point, most independents are just as partisan as bleeding heart liberals or hardcore conservatives. Right. They just choose not to identify with the party. They still vote normally as as a partisan would. Most right. don't uh, ticket split. It's probably less than 5% of the total national electorate. So going back to what you said, Democrats just have to do a better job of... of, of Being Democrats. Of, of, of encouraging people to say our policies are better. And that's why you should vote for us in the general election. That's, that's our, generally our policies, what I'm getting. Our policies are better and our values are right. Uh, right. And that's why people should vote for uh, Democrats and policies that we're pushing for. Once we choose our own nominee. Okay. So um, what did you think of Tom Perez's response? Because he sent out a response right after, um, right after that, right after the Donna Brazil story broke. Uh, about Tom's response? Yeah, Tom's response. I thought it addressed some of the uh, some of the concerns that uh, folks have, but really, this is about what happened in, at the previous administration. Uh, I'm a brand new DNC member. I uh, came into office immediately after the national convention, so I've never served under Debbie Washerman's belt. Good for you. Um, but <laughs> many many DNC members, like myself, regardless of who we supported in the primary. We all want increased transparency, and we were going to get that either way with, with Tom or with Keith. And I, I know we, we have amazing staff now at the DNC. We have a full-time, essentially campaign-level uh, staff numbers. We're, we're building out our, our fundraising um, expertise, and our local and, and comm staff are, are well-stocked. But this is about organizing on the ground every single day. And that's the mission of the DNC uh, today. And we, we saw those results in, in New Jersey, in Virginia, in Maine, and, and throughout the rest of the country tonight. So um, what are some of the steps that you got that have, as a new DNC member that have encouraged you um, and that have encouraged you? And then what are areas, other than the transparency piece, um, what are areas that you think the party needs to improve? Well, I, I'm, I'm encouraged from some of the staffing hires that the DNC has, has made under this leadership team, um, but I'm also 
deeply encouraged as a TNC member, the fact that our leadership is actually willing to, to listen to us. That's something that's been uh, been missing from the DNC for not only during the Obama years, but uh, going back decades. Uh, when we have a Democratic president, they tell the DNC who they want as chair and the other officer positions, and we go along with it. And we're ignored uh, most often. But now we, we have a comparatively a tremendous impact on uh, the DNC's process moving forward. I'll give you a quick example. At our uh, meeting in, in Las Vegas just a couple weeks ago, uh, we elected uh, new at-large appointees to the DNC as well as uh, committee appointments. And for the very first time from anyone that anyone can remember, uh, they actually solicited input from DNC members. And at least half of us, uh, 200 out of the uh, 400 or so who are not appointed um, or elected at large, 200 of us represent the state. I'm one of 20 who are elected from uh, from California. And our our voice is is our state party's voice. And if we're not listened to, then our state parties aren't listened to. But to, to be able to have an impact on this broader process is something that uh, a lot of us did not expect going into into the DNC. Well, I know, uh, you know, we've got we're waiting on the Unity Commission's uh, report soon. Hopefully that will have an impact on the way that the DNC moves I mean, forward. Very quickly, there was this recent, you know, shake up where Tom Perez got sort of rid of some of the more Ellison slash Bernie uh, people and replace them with, well, I don't, I don't think Drexel likes the term, sort of establishment. Um, this was just happened, what, in the last two weeks or so? Uh, what was your reaction to that? So this is part of the, the normal process. The at-large DNC members who are presented as a slate by the DNC chair every four years are elected by the, the full DNC. Um, so this is normal. This is part of the, the normal process. Um, elections often have consequences. But uh, the, the goal, the stated goal of these uh, new D charges is for diversity because you can't always guarantee that those elected from the states are going to have enough uh, diversity to actually reflect the, the party that we're serving. And so I'm very excited about the, the level of diversity that we have with these large uh, DNC members. We, we have our, our first transgendered woman of color. We doubled the number of Native Americans uh, in, in on the DNC, uh, we have more LGBT. We doubled the number of millennials on the DNC, and coming as a, a one of the few millennials elected from the state, that's that's very important for for me as well. But at the end of the day, I'm excited that we have new blood at the DNC because this is not a fun or easy job. It's entirely volunteer. No one pays us to to do this. Everything that. Uh, we do everywhere we go on, on these meetings or traveling to, to represent the, the constituencies that we represent. All of that comes out of our, our own pocket. Um, new DNC members, we want to see change and uh, structural change, transparency uh, at the DNC. So I'm excited to, to meet more of these new DNC members and uh, figuring out how we can all work together to move our party forward and start winning more elections. Well, if tonight is any indication, hopefully the DNC will prevail coming up soon. Uh, thanks, Michael, for pop popping on and uh, and giving us your insight into that. I mean, there's a lot going on at the DNC, so we will, you'll have to come back and talk about the Unity Commission once uh, that report comes back out. Happy to. Thank thanks, you Michael. so much. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, yeah, I could talk about this. Diversity. All day. Yes, that was a great answer. I'm glad that he mentioned that. Well, that's the official answer, except when you look underneath the surface, the diversity thing, as far as I could tell, didn't really hold up. But uh, listen, we uh, don't need to be argumentative. Uh, I'm glad he answered the question. <laughs> and sorry it didn't excited. go the way. Sorry it wasn't the answer that you wanted from him. Um, anyway. But the answer did happen across America today. The, the, the thing that he said that I was like, I thought you were about to like fall out of your chair was when he said that Bernie Sanders is a better, better Democrat than the Democrats. Which, is, which I think is, I, I think from a vote standpoint, 
is generally true. There are some different. I mean, if I had to put, Scott, if I had to put, if I had to put, can you Joe, get this on? I was going to say, can somebody record this? Forgetting that right we now. actually are. If, if we had to stack up, I'm going to create a video and play it over oh and over. If we had to <laughs> stack up votes between Joe Manson, Heidi Helm, you know, some of these Democrats, and and a Bernie Sanders out of out of when it comes to voting with Democrats, yeah, on voting on the voting record, Bernie Sanders definitely votes more with Democrats than some Democrats that are in red states it makes more sense i mean you're he's in vermont which it typically is a democratic state for the most part and he votes just like his constituents uh, would want him to so uh, you know i, I think that's going to be tough for some other democrats but i think uh, my point is always and I, mean, I know michael said it the same way which was we want to encourage those people to become democrats to which i also said there are some people who just not not based off of party not based off of like Oh, I don't want to be a member of the Democratic Party. Is sometimes I want to vote Republican. Sometimes I want to vote for the Democrat, and, and that's fine. Or sometimes the Democrats aren't Democrat enough for me. No, but what I'm saying. Or sometimes Republicans aren't Republican enough for it. So, but independents typically ride the line in the middle, and they don't want to identify with either side. And that's typically that's totally fine if they want to do that. But when it comes to, to me, in my opinion, as I've always said, if you want to be involved, if you want to have a say in who the nominee representing Democrats, the Democratic Party, it is my view that you be a Democrat. That I would concede that if an independent had a viable chance. But that's the reality of the situation. So if the reality of the situation is you gotta choose one of two parties, you go with the one that you're closest to. In the general election. <laughs> you can't, the, you, you got to get in through the primary first. Yes, but. So you can't just show up in the general election. It doesn't. The, and that's why, that's why states give you time to change your voter registration, to do all of that. Uh, you have time to do that. And, uh, you know, we want it, but it goes back to policy versus party. If you identify your policy, if your policies and your general values and feelings identify more with Democrats, you're going to vote for the Democrat. And that's just the reality of the situation. And however, when it comes down to a Republican, because then what's going to happen is, what if a Republican wants to run in a Democrat? What if a Republican I wants mean, to vote in an There are so many, primary? you know, like hyper. There okay, are some but hypothetical. The question is, did anybody say, oh, Bernie's not Democratic enough to vote for him? I don't him. think it was so much that. It was Bernie's not a Democrat. That was the argument. Not that Bernie's not Democratic enough, that Bernie's not a Democrat. And we just didn't see, you know, but whatever. Um, anyway, but. Democrats across the country won tonight. Yeah. Okay. So should we? Should we? Let's go into some election results real quick. Yeah. Whew. Okay. I was expecting um, to look over here and see some uh, election-related thing. Instead, we see that Trump delivered a speech in South Korea. Yeah. No. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been exactly one year since Donald Trump was elected president. Um, mm. Since then, we've only seen one high-profile election, uh, the House race in Georgia that saw Karen Handel defeat John Ossoff. Uh, we talked about it a few months ago. Um, but with the Russian investigation heating up and the president's agenda, I like to call it agenda non grata, uh, tonight, we'll see, uh, tonight we saw that that kind of stuff matters in states across the country. So uh, let's talk briefly about the current breakdown of the Republican governors across the country. Republicans currently hold 34 governor seats. Democrats hold 15, independents hold one. Um, in next year's elections, 36 states with governors are up for re-election. So tonight, uh, we'll start with Virginia. Uh, Tara McAuffle is termed out because Virginia governors can only serve one term. Uh, Ralph Northam has defeated Ed Gillespie. Uh, right now, it's 53-45. Um, it, something that I was curious about, and, and maybe Scott will know this, why is it that Virginia was is the most important of all the races. Why is it being held up as the marquee? Is it because it's the purple state, it's the only one? Or is there some other reason why that's the top of the list of what everyone's looking at? Yeah, let's, uh, let's bring Scott in. Hey, Scott Moore. Hi. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you for um, having me. So yeah, so what about Virginia? What makes Virginia, I mean, we know it's a purple state for the most part. I oh, mean, Chelsea was just Until asked. tonight, although I'm starting to see that it really is becoming a Democratic state. It's pretty much in the Democratic column now ever since, uh, you know, uh, Obama first won it in 2008 after it had gone Republicans for 44 years. 
at the presidential level. Since 1964, they had not gone for a Democrat at the presidential level until Obama. So is that why we're all looking at it so closely? Or? Well, compared to, t well, first of all, th this state and New Jersey, the only two that sort of have this off year um, vote. And so it's the first big barometer of after a new president is in office to see how the voters are feeling. And, you know, it's not really, it, it's a big solid win for Northam not to deny that, um, especially with the rain and the weather that they had in Northern Virginia today. We thought that turnout would be dampened a little bit, uh, pun intended. Oh, nicely played. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, is the fact that it was a pretty much of a swing type state for a very long time. And um, now we're starting to see it become more democratic like Nevada. And uh, this is clearly cementing that for them tonight um, with that big Northam win. And it's he had such a good win that he's now pulling the rest of the uh, Democrats with him across the victory line tonight. Yeah, we, we were talking about it before the uh, the show started. The House of Delegates just elected its first transgender mm -hmm. uh, House of Delegates across the nation uh, in Danica, Rome, uh, which yes. is amazing. Which went against a Republican who was for a bathroom bill in Virginia. Yes. So that's great news. It's, it's, it's an like, extra mm -hmm. like... Right, right. Mm -hmm. A little slap in the face. Uh, and then it looks like Democrats are going to take the House of Delegates um, in yes. Virginia. Which was not expected, although there's quite a few that are really, really, really close nail biters, and I'm sure there'll be recounts because the Republicans are going to go out and try to scrape by and get whatever they can because they weren't expecting it at all. They thought they were still going to keep the supermajority uh, with Republicans there in Virginia, but now it doesn't look like they will anymore. So have both the lieutenant governor and the AG been called? Yes. Uh, lieutenant governor, uh, the Democrat, and uh, what's it, Fairfax mm -hmm. uh, is going to beat uh, the Republican challenger there, and the Democrat uh, incumbent attorney general will keep uh, their seat as well. Um, but one of the things Chelsea pointed out was if you look at Virginia's map, it's primarily red for the most right, part in is. those rural areas. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to carry down into um, some of the other states like North Carolina um, and... Uh, you just North said that with like a southern Yes, accent. I love that. <laughs> and, uh, and Georgia, uh, Stacey Abrams has her race coming up next year in Georgia. Do you think that that Virginia win might push some of that down or are we going to go into 2018... Um, do you think Democrats are going to go in 2018 with some trajectory, some momentum? momentum? Oh, I definitely think they'll get some momentum. I mean, if you really look at the big picture and you see how everything's going out, we're really not seeing anything that surprising uh, as far as the way the pendulum usually swings. Like, if you look back at 2009, uh, both Virginia and New Jersey went to Republican governors. That's when Chris Christie won the first time. That's when Bob McDonnell uh, won in Virginia. And uh, and then you saw Republicans pick up seats in the midterms, which is, you know, pretty typical of the opposing party of the president. So when you're looking at the big picture, you know, after eight years, it's usually very hard for the same party to keep power with the presidency, even though 2016 was quirky on a lot of different levels. But if you're just looking at it on paper, you would see this is a pretty typical pattern. Then the first off year election, you see that the opposing party of the president is picking up seats. So it's sort of right on schedule of what we expect to see. And if we were to expect to see 2018, we would expect that the Democrats would pick up quite a few seats. And like you brought up earlier, the governor's races are going to be huge because we have so many open seats next year in very big populated states like Florida and Ohio and Georgia and Michigan, like all those states uh, that have a chance to turn over to Democrats. So it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, statewide uh, elections do. And that's where Democrats really need to start getting the upper hand again to start picking back some of those seats they lost um, in 2010, um, because that's going to be very important for their future uh, successes. Well, let's talk about uh, New Jersey real quick. Mm -hmm. So uh, Chris Christie <laughs> apparently got into a fight, an argument today with a voter, <laughs> Jesus, on his way out. Uh, he's termed out uh, candidates mm -hmm. Phil Murphy and uh, what, did I, what did I call her uh, last week? Uh, her nickname is... Um, uh, uh, Kim, Kim Trails Kim. Yeah. Kim Trails Kim. <laughs> uh, Kim Guard Guadano. Uh, Phil Murphy has defeated uh, Kim Guardano out of New Jersey. What do we know about this guy? I mean, I've heard that he was a former Goldman S uh, Sachs exec, so I wasn't mm -hmm. that thrilled about him. But do you know anything more about him? I mean, he's he's moderate, but you know, I think you could have almost put anyone. Not nothing against Phil Murphy, but you could have put almost anyone that was a Democrat next to their name and and one in New Jersey. I mean, there's Should've no said way. Drexel. Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> I could have really. Run. You could have, because uh, Chris Christie was so incredibly unpopular that there was no way he was going to win again. How and did he start off like he used to be yeah. somebody that 
pretty moderate. I mean, Bridge I was, Gate. Bridge I, Gate. I, yeah. I remember Started when Oprah out. had him yeah. on her show. And he, is that where his downfall I, began? I think it was all the secrecy around Bridge Gate. If right. you live in those tri-state areas, if you live in New York and New Jersey mm -hmm. um, and you can't get to work, like public transit, like Bill de Blasio, because um, we're going to go into New York City yeah. right now, uh, you know, just rerun, just won re-election out of New York. Um, and I'm a little shocked at the number because of how the MTA has been a problem for New Yorkers over mm -hmm. the past year. It's gotten worse in the past year since de Blasio took over. Um, but we, but the other part of that is I think New Yorkers are a little bit smarter to real. It's, it's weird because I feel like New Yorkers are a little bit smarter to, that realize that the MTA is not controlled by the city. It's controlled by the state of New York mm -hmm. and that that's on Governor Cuomo and not on Bill de Blasio. Um, but they're but, easy to confuse when you're like, because you, you don't know the difference between MTA city and, city. and, and you're thinking like, yeah. it's citywide. Yeah. And also the, uh, the fun thing about, Fun fact about Bill de Blasio is we've not had a New York City mayor that was a Democrat win re-election in decades. Yeah, which is surprising when you think of New York City as being the liberal bastion. But you know we had uh, Rudy Giuliani, and then we had uh, Bloomberg who was an independent and went on and won that third term. So we've had a very long period of time where we have not had a Democrat in a Democratic city actually win re-election as mayor. So. Well, that Democrats can thank yeah. Donald Trump, can who is from. Can always count on mm -hmm. Scott for some amazing <laughs> random weird so random facts. facts. Um, the the other uh, the other uh, really crazy thing that was coming out of New York was the qu ballot measure uh, question one on the Constitutional Convention, uh, whether or not mm -hmm. uh, New York wanted to hold a constitutional be a part of the constitutional convention to explore proposals for revisions or amendments to the state constitution i know a lot of my friends we have marty cummings on from the hell's kitchen democrats on a few weeks ago uh, hell's kitchen democrats were pushing out that they should be voting no um and it looks like that ballot measure is about to fail with wow with dramatic effect um, 71% right now uh, with 21% reporting. Um, we're still waiting on some numbers from the Utah special election mm -hmm. um, to replace Jason Chavez. Mm -hmm. We can also probably project that Garland Gilchrist, who was on our show oh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, Yay. will win his Detroit uh, city clerk uh, race, which is great because I'm yes. pretty sure he's going to be. We said it here yes. first. He's going to be a, a, a congressman out of Michigan at some or point. Or some really good high level some, office. Right, we, I was here on that show yes, yes, yes. too, and he was fantastic. He's great. So yeah, congrats uh, definitely to congrats to him. And I know that there are a lot of uh, candidates from Run for Something who have won. Uh, Don, uh, Danica Rohrm was one of them uh, who have won their seats across the country. So, you know, that is a, to me, a reminder that. Even if you don't think you have the money to run, mm -hmm. just get on a ballot somewhere, whether or not it's for school board, whether or not it's for city council, whether or not it's for city clerk, even though you might not. I mean, do look into it, um, but don't, don't run for something you don't have a clue about. Right. But do run for something uh, that you think matters in yeah, your city. Especially and, local. I mean, that's where it all starts. Right. And that's where the most interaction with your constituents is, is the local races. That's so important. Um, the other race that we're waiting on this year that will end the year will be the Alabama special mm -hmm. election uh, to re replace uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Uh, Doug Jones is trailing Roy Moore uh, just by a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's closer than we think it mm -hmm. is. Um, so that is, de you know, if, if tonight is any other than getting out to run for something, is if tonight is any testament for Democrats, regardless of the problems that the DNC is having, because, I, you know, I think that people forget. And that's something that Michael said. The DNC as an entity doesn't have a lot of power. You know, it is a fundraising mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's really their job is to fundraise and then kind of push that stuff back out. But it really is up to people who value policy to get out and vote and to do that. Um, and then you see those numbers that happen across the country. So um, wow. let that sink in. <laughs> Look at what happened tonight, because when Democrats vote, Democrats win, no matter if your state legislator has gerrymandered the shit out mm -hmm. of your state. It's true. When Democrats get out there, they win. And um, what, is Virginia very badly? No, I'm saying I'm saying like, but most. Well, it, it has been yeah. yes, and um, and like we were saying earlier, it is very red and rural through the majority of the state. You really, what really has been carrying it the past couple of years has been Northern Virginia. Uh, the suburbs of D.C., and then you get a little bit in Richmond, you get a little bit at Newport News and everything, but the rest of the state is very uh, red. But, you know, going back to that, Northam has done much better 
uh, in the rural areas and downstate in Virginia than Trump did this time last year. Wow. So how, he's definitely. How, how do you think he connected with them? Um, well, I mean, he's already been. Well, a, he been already a, said. Well, just I just want to piggyback on what yeah. you said because I, I think what might have pushed him over was that sanctuary city uh, comment last mm-hmm. week in some of those rural areas, which could have had an effect and hurt him with certain Democrats. Mm-hmm. But I always stress this, which is. Our party, who wants to be full of everybody's ideas, has to embrace the fact that there are people with other ideas. And right. I know that Chelsea and I might argue. We don't even argue on the ideas because our ideas are somewhat similar mm-hmm. in that respect. We just like, we just disagree on the process for the most part. Um, but you know, if there is a Democrat who does not agree with one thing for you, that does not mean you can't vote for them. Mm-hmm. It just means you just disagree. And there are far more policies out there that are important. If you don't agree, because we all know that Democrats across the board are for reforming immigration policy. That doesn't necessarily mean that dem- that, I- that they're going to let an influx of immigrants in. So he, he made a comment about not supporting sanctuary cities. This Co- is- yes. After he voted to kill the bill that would stop sanctuary cities from coming into Virginia, he then said that if the bill got to his desk, that he would vote for that bill. Now, whether or not that was a last Hail Mary ditch effort to bring in rural voters from Virginia, that's one thing. But it almost cost him some mm-hmm. of the more progressive votes out of um, out of Virginia. But that goes back to what I was saying, which was just because you might disagree with him on, say, immigration, doesn't mean that health care is not on the ballot. It doesn't mean that women's rights are not on the ballot and gay rights and civil right. rights and criminal justice reform and all that stuff that are really important to other people across the state. Um, exactly. It just means that you got to find a way to once he gets elected. And that's the people said that about Hillary Clinton. Once you get elected, we got to pull Hillary Clinton back to the left. You know, now that she's talked about center, 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 and talked to the center people, we got to pull her back left. That's the same thing for Ralph Norman. That would have been the same thing for any candidate, whether or not Bernie Sanders was on the left, they would have had to pull him back to the center to try to see how people can govern. So it's just a matter of that balancing act. And I think that people have to start to realize that Democrats like to like to um, work together with other people and reach across the aisle and kind of govern properly like adults. But I think that's the problem. <laughs> no, but I do think it's a problem with, like you're saying, if, if you're so focused on a one issue thing and then, and I think that's what happened a lot of times last year in the presidential race is like if, if you focus on one issue and you feel like you, you that candidate doesn't agree with your issue, you're not going to go out or be as encouraged to vote and now you let the worst candidate that disagrees on 100% of your issues end up winning when you don't go out and vote when it's that one issue. But that is a problem that people do. They focus on one issue. This is the difficulty with Democrats. Voter. Everybody, mm-hmm. yeah, w- with Democrats, mm-hmm. one issue voter, it's a different issue. Right. But the Republicans, their one issue is, is usually abortion or taxes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Or which, which is crazy. don't let the Democrat win. I will vote for whoever, <laughs> right. like they did. I will vote for Trump. By not allowing Hillary to to win. That is, no matter what, if they didn't like Trump at all, they still did not want Hillary to win, and that was their one issue vote. And they went out in full force, and that's when you see these these quirky elections where people end up winning because then the Democrats are sitting back saying the one issue vote that Hillary wasn't as passionate about as they were, and they didn't go out and vote. Speaking of passionate votes, um, just to move on, um, Paul Ryan Hmm. um, has stopped his keg stands. And you love somehow, that about him. I do. It's so good. Like, it's such a crazy like image for you. Like, not only just a crazy image, but like a crazy story that he would have told out loud. That he said out loud. Like I was dreaming about doing tax reform with keg stands and blah blah blah, and taking money away from people and giving it back to the rich. Um, like that's such a crazy like <laughs> thing. Um, but the House Republicans unveiled their tax plan. Um, that Vox.com said the numbers are in, and the House Republican bill raises taxes on nearly a third of Americans. Um, a few weeks ago, we broke down the Trump White House tax plan. Um, so, Scott, when you saw the Republican, the House Republican tax plan mm-hmm. come down the pike last week, what do you think? Well, I think like most of us, we felt like it's uh, it's it's pretty sad. Um, it just on paper, you know. There could be some things that could give a short-term boost um, for some people and businesses too. If the business rate goes down, there's a chance that yes, they could theoretically hire more people and there's more okay, jobs. But... but no, I'm just saying on on just the general before we get into it. But the problem is even that short-term bump that they think is going to happen is not going to be enough to help close the gap of the deficit that they're now going to have with them right. to begin with. 
Not to say all the other people that are going to be affected by paying more in taxes, not to mention some of the states with the higher uh, real estate values that are now going to have their exemptions lost, be able to write off their property in state and local taxes. Um, when you start putting all that into place, it's not a really good plan at all. And once again, they can take something and mess it up. So two things about that. The first is about the you know drop the tax mm -hmm. uh, rate for businesses. Mm -hmm. Most businesses are very small businesses right, that have passed through taxation. Mm -hmm. So their businesses aren't taxed, they are personally mm -hmm. taxed. And so it's not gonna really make a difference no, for them. Absolutely. So really the only ben businesses that this benefits are the large right. multinational. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Billions so, and billions of dollars right. they already so have. So this is not gonna help, you know, no. Grandpa Joe and no. his auto mechanic shop absolutely. do much at all. And this goes back to something that we talked about a few weeks ago when we were on the Trump Report, which I know if you're watching this show right now, I know there's a lot of people watching this show right now. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome <laughs> to the new people. I saw somebody in the UK. I'm watching the chat right now. So, um, Quite but, a multitasker. Yeah, I'm trying to do things. <laughs> things on, um, that we talked about, that we talk about a lot, which is Republican voters have this idea in their head that that they that people will do good for you know what i mean that right. people generally are good people and that they that corporations or somebody at the top because they share similar they religious that. that's the only similar, way they can sell their stuff right but i'm saying voters think that oh. because corporation or somebody at the top might share their religious value for right. for example that they will say you know what i'm going to help out the small people people but people republican voters forget that the shareholders come first absolutely and, and then you get the pennies do. after that right. um it's and all about the shareholders it's all first. about the shareholders it's not about first. you it's not about the company it's all about of the shareholders making their money um, but i wanted to bring up something about what scott what you said about um uh the budget deficit mm -hmm. because it looks like that because this bill adds to the deficit that reconciliation they cannot put this bill they can, this can't go through the reconciliation process and they have to get 60 votes to pass this bill mm -hmm. which would effectively kill this bill mm -hmm. even before it started coming yes, down the pipe absolutely. so senator paul rand can be at home nursing his five broken ribs yeah. doesn't oh, have to rand, race rand that paul, right. by the way yes. not paul rand but that's all right he said, he said Did I, I got his name he dyslexic. Said Paul, Paul Rand. <laughs> <laughs> and I fell for it too. Ryan Rand, Paul Ryan, and they're all the same. Rand, Paul, Paul, Actually, Paul I was going to talk about Paul Ryan because I heard uh, his press conference today where he was repeating over and over the grand savings of a thousand dollars that most Americans would enjoy. First of all, I don't even think it's most Americans. And second no. of all, I can't believe that it is so such a pathetic tax cut that he's trying to say that a thousand dollars is gonna make a massive difference in people's lives. Will it make a difference? Of course. Sure. But But it's short term and short lived. And then and that's the problem and that then we're, very we're, soon mm -hmm. the middle class is gonna have this increase in their taxes. So this one thousand dollars is gonna go poof. Right. in a couple of years and then you have a bigger deficit and uh, again they're they're relying too heavily on like we were saying is that somehow now these companies are going to hire all these people and we're going to have accelerated growth in four or five percent i wish that we could like say okay we're going to give you this money and then mm -hmm. let's let's see what you do with it if you don't you got to give the money back mm -hmm. you got to pay the taxes pay right. that you would have paid under the Kinda old like rules. the bank bill out right <laughs> you got to pay us back. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about just uh, some specifics of this bill. So the House bill uh, reduces the tax brackets from seven to four. So when we talked about it a few weeks ago, we did say that the Trump White House plan wanted three brackets. Mm -hmm. um, so now the House uh, bill has a 39 percent, 35 percent, 25 percent and 12 percent with the 35 percent being the new bracket, because I think it went from 39, 25, right. 12 in mm -hmm. the Trump plan. Um, the top one percent of households would see no change in their tax bracket. But it would increase taxes on the lower tax brackets for some people. Um, we talked about the individual. Oh, it would repeal the individual alternative minimum tax. Um, and, of course, the big one is the estate tax, uh, which it would repeal um, after six years. Uh, and in the meantime, doubling the amount of inherited wealth that is exempt from the tax to $11 million. Uh, to $11 million from 5.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, which is really going to affect a lot of people. Hardworking Americans there. That oh have yeah, to deal with you know I'm waiting on that. My five and a half million um, now be exempt <laughs> double. Um, but they're the the Republicans are trying to sell the the doubling of the standard deduction as if it's going to help mm -hmm. regular Americans. Um, I mean, and, it sounds great. Of yeah. course, so they, it sounds great on paper. But right. yeah, if you start looking at the details, you realize it's not that good. And 
it's going to cause more issues. And again, they're relying too heavily on expecting that we're going to have accelerated growth and we're going to have four or five percent every quarter. Which, by the way, we're at the you know we're at some point we're going to have a correction with this right. economy. We can only go so long we are in, in this the expansion phase. Longest we're on the, expansion yes. in I don't know. You're probably going to tell me down to the month when yes. it's been this long. <laughs> it is but longest. this is extraordinarily long. And that's why we have to know that at some point it's going to slow. And, you know, you keep seeing Trump crow about all these great economic things and the Dow Jones. Dow Jones, first of all, doesn't represent the majority of the economy anyways. Um, and for him to talk about that, I, I keep saying, well, is he going to start talking about when things start I mean, to the, inevitably slow down? Part of the reason why down. these companies are so excited is because there's nobody policing them. Right. They, they know that they own the policemen yeah. and the you know the lawmakers so yeah. they're sort of free to do what they want and yeah that's going to make profits go up and it's going to make them excited so stock prices go up but that's not a real increase in value no it's and it's not going to help fluff. the everyday worker that's like we're saying that feels that you know this tax plan they're trying to sell it's good to now help the everyday worker to be able to pay their bills and do what they need Joe to the do. Plumber's do not think, getting that no yeah, do we think that i mean it'd be interesting I mean, this is going to have to go through so fast because they need to get it done right. by like Thanksgiving. So there's yeah. not going to be time for town halls, and there's no. not going to be time. So, I, I, I just am so curious to to know whether voters are going to fall for the marketing plan of the Republicans, or if they're really going to scratch beneath the surface and take a look at what this actually does. And it would have been fun to see in town halls how people responded, but we won't have that luxury. No, and it might not even get to that point no. either because if they if if from the Senate rules, if the Byrd rule holds, mm -hmm. this bill won't even make it to the Senate floor. To allow, I mean, Democrats wouldn't even allow it to get to the Senate floor, or Mitch McConnell would try I, it. I, I then, was going to say, I don't find, I, I don't uh, put it past Mitch McConnell to try th some dirty, underhanded way to get it through some arcane rule uh, and and try to push it through. But I, I, majority of people actually are not in support of the tax bill as it is right now. Even right. Republicans. Correct. Like, well, Republicans, of course, are. But as far as the overall population, it, yes. it's something not like popular. Something like 60 percent, something like that. Yeah, it's um, not popular. I just want to jump on the a couple of last minute things on this bill. So under the Republican plan, going back to the corporations, corporations are still allowed to, det to deduct state and local taxes because we talked about last time where um, it would eliminate state and local deductions uh, that would primarily hurt the larger and bluer states, of especially course. California and yeah. New York, uh, for the individual. But corporations mm -hmm. are still allowed to deduct state of and local course, taxes. Yeah. Workers <laughs> are not. Corporations are still allowed to, to deduct business expenses. So that means if you're an actor or you're a teacher or you're some independent contractor, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to do that yeah. under this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, corporations are still allowed to deduct more than $10,000 in property taxes. Homeowners are not. Mm -hmm. And corporations are still allowed to deduct deduct moving expenses under this plan, but families mm -hmm. are not. So, goes back to what we always say on this program, Yep, Republicans hate Americans. <laughs> well, corporations are people, according to Republicans, so they're taking they care of their, their, their favorite they're kind of people. Of their, their kind of people. Oh they're they're rich um, people. They certainly hate so, families. So mm -hmm. clearly this is a terrible plan, but is there going to be a new fire lit under the Republicans because of tonight, where they say, oh, sh crap, we've really mm -hmm. got to do something, otherwise we're going to get our asses handed to us come 2018, or, you know, that's like a year away, so maybe it won't um, still affect us, but they want to get something oh, done. Oh, they want to get something done because they want to have a check mark next to something on their agenda because they obviously couldn't do that with health care, and they're starting to see that time whittle away now of being able to have an opportunity because now we're going to start getting into the primaries and we're going to start getting into these Republicans having to run, and they're going to have to run on a record that shows they've done nothing. So if they go, so Thanksgiving is in two weeks. Mm -hmm. If, say, we can't, say Republicans can't get this this bill through because they got to get 60 votes mm -hmm. and they can't do it. What is next that Republicans can do? Because if they go into Thanksgiving, that's it. If right. they can't get this bill done after Thanksgiving, they got nothing else. Infrastructure? They can't even do infrastructure, no. even because Democrats, Democrats would be like, "Oh, after right. tonight's election, yeah. and you couldn't get this done." Well, yeah, we're not helping you going into 2018. But they also can't agree on infrastructure I mean, either because they don't want to spend the money on it. I mean, immigration. No. I mean, are they going to try and do something to at least pretend to try and help the Dreamers? Maybe. And and the wall, they do right? That either. Didn't they? Th there's been six. Like, yeah, the wall prototypes. And one yeah. has been selected. 
potentially they're still you know looking at that but let's i don't see that happening either anytime soon yeah and so if they go into 2018 they really mm -hmm. got nothing no they're going to go into a lot a whole lot of nothing there's going to be approving judges like mitch mcconnell kind of wants to do whatever is, yeah that which oh. is equally no, as infuriating it's very infuriating yeah um but i think that if we continue it like i, I think republic go back to your point what can they do maybe they'll just try to impeach donald trump <laughs> no, seriously. Ooh. Like maybe uh, they'll be like, you know what? This guy's causing us right. massive Too problems. Much more He's problems. over there in Japan talking about yeah. Japan moving their cars over here, which is kind of crazy in the grand scheme of things. And uh, so I guess we'll. I mean, maybe that's their last ditch effort and to then, win in twenty eighteen. You know, pretty soon, I think the next one to go down in an in indictment is uh, Michael Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the there's been some fun. Uh, well, I don't know how true it is. You know, I don't know when you read these things online about yeah, how Mike about Flynn is freaking out because they've got his son I, potentially I so, yeah. on an, on espionage, mm -hmm. which is a capital it's treason. Offense, yeah. But mm -hmm. I mean, you could be killed mm -hmm. by this, the the government for mm -hmm. for doing that. Yeah. And so apparently, based on what I read, and I have not like double triple checked it, so I don't know but yeah, if it's even partially and, true that one's going to be the next one and then you've heard about jared but also you hear you know wilbur ross to me is on the hot seat now too for They're his own time. well seat. yes but i mean it's the next cabinet officials uh you know that he's definitely got some issues now to deal with and I've because heard of russian ties yes yeah. and the banking ties that he had with paul manafort and cyprus and all these other companies that he's been involved with um and he looks like this innocent little grandfather but he definitely um has a lot of issues that i think he could be next to go and i've heard rumors about betsy devos yeah, as well there's, so there's there's mm. definitely a lot of problems but we'll yeah. definitely leave it there scott thanks for coming oh i just had show. one more thing medicaid uh expansion in maine is another big one that's yes. winning right now and that's going to be very important as well for the future of health insurance uh and so go gotta get it done for that and it looks like it's leading right now uh we definitely want to thank you scott and michael mm -hmm. Cap from the dnc for coming on today as always we love having you in the chat room and your listener and viewer feedback so continue to leave your comments and thoughts on the show um uh <laughs> follow us on twitter at political beat tv or email us at political beat tv at gmail.com mark your calendars december 5th uh we're doing a 2017 year in review show with the trump report in this studio mm -hmm. so we're gonna have a lot of fun with christian and scott and brooke everybody the whole family's coming in uh on december 5th don't oh, forget to check out reunion. the uh survivor after show on wednesday gotham after show on thursdays and get the latest on what you should be watching on your dvr with the after buzz dvr report uh so follow after buzz tv on all social media to find out when your favorite shows are on be sure to subscribe to political beat on itunes podcast and we'll see you all next tuesday right here on the political beat bye From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Bye. Uh, see you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.